uh, Descartes, a great philosopher, had this statement, I think, therefore I am. But I would ask you to question that. Because you think, is that your amnes, or does the amnes come before the thoughts? Now, a Korean Zen master, Song Sunim, wrote this poem. Coming empty-handed, going empty-handed, that is human. When you are born, where do you come from? When you die, where do you go? Life is like a floating cloud which appears. Death is like a floating cloud which disappears. The floating cloud itself originally does not exist. Life and death, coming and going, are also like that. But there is one thing which always remains clear. It is pure and clear, not depending on life and death. Then what is the one pure and clear thing? And if you come up with an answer to it, it's not it. There is no answer to that question, what is the one pure and clear thing? And yet, it is the essence of who we are, who each one of us is. I heard a man say one day that there's seven billion two hundred and thirty million paths to God. Every person on this planet is on their own journey. They really are. Now that doesn't mean we don't get together like we do here to study our belief system, to do our practices together, just like people all around the world do on whatever holy day they set aside to do their spiritual practice. Because we all know that we're not just this limited mind and body. There's something much more going on. And of course, we can glimpse that moreness at very special times. At the birth of a child. That's really ma magical and mystical. A death can be very magical and mystical. And so, the real question is, if we look at this process, this human process, as the crucible for expression, expressing our divinity, from the big picture, God created the heavens and the earth. God created the universe, and what do we know about the universe? The universe is a constant process of creation and destruction. The most beautiful pictures of the universe that we get from the Hubble telescope our destruction, stars exploding, gases coming together to form new planets. There's an incredible dynamic process in the universe. And guess who's a part of that process? Each one of us. So why do we want to limit ourselves by our thoughts and beliefs? Why limit ourselves when there's something that is so much more but the mystery is, how do we get there? How do we get there? And every religion has a practice called meditation. How many people do meditation on a regular basis? Meditation on a regular basis can open a door. Can open a door that our thoughts cannot take us to because the practice of meditation is about quieting the mind. And when the mind, and I'm talking about the little mind, when the little mind gets quiet, something magical can happen. And meditation is an intrinsic part of prayer. I always like to think about prayer and meditation. As prayer is talking to God, meditation is listening. And I tell you what, in our culture, everybody, everybody would rather be talking than listening. And I won't even go political. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> I caught myself, Victor. It's like, oh, my, my little side commentary about politics. Oh, Ooh, shake that off. <laughs> but see, what, what is so beautiful, and we see the divine in expression, 
And the paradox is, not only is the divine in the expression of the positive, it's also an expression in the negative. But if we identify with the negative to the exclusion of the positive, or if we try to cling to the positive to the exclusion of the negative, we're missing out on the alchemical process of creation itself because the universe is creation and destruction. So how do we really embrace it all? Now, of course, what we know is in Unity, Myrtle Fillmore took a life-threatening disease and transformed it into a blessing that became Silent Unity. Charles Fillmore, her husband, who's a realtor, there was a downturn in the real estate market, so he had time on his hands. So he was kind of surprised about it. Man, what is Myrtle doing here? Getting together, praying with people in their living room in the evenings, and it starts expanding and getting bigger, so he gets interested. And, what, and that is such a perfect expression of the divine, because there's the feminine and there's the masculine. Did you know that each one of us contain the potential feminine and masculine? If you look at um, yoga people, the right side of the body is the masculine, the left side is the feminine. And can you bring that into balance? Because yoga, it means union. Union of body and spirit, but it also means union of mind and body. And so this process, and so here we have Myrtle doing prayer work, finding the blessing in the difficulties of life. And that's what each one of us want to do. Rather than rejecting what we, th what our little mind says is bad and grasping after what we want or what we think is good, we actually can learn to hold life with an open hand. And that's very much been my 27 year journey on this spiritual path. Because my first wife and I both had real problems with alcohol. And so I got involved with Alcoholics Anonymous 27 years ago, and I count that as the birth of my spiritual life. And I guarantee you up to that point, if my thinking could control my behavior, if thinking, the little mind thinking, could make me happy, I would have been the happiest, most peaceful, contented person in the world 69 years ago. But what I found out is the little mind thinking is conditioned. And what the Buddha says is that all thoughts in our mind, all beliefs in our mind, are conditioned by this process called life. From birth, we grow up. Because when you're born, can anybody not look at a baby and see how whole, perfect, and complete a baby is? And it just touches our heart. And we just, you know... There's the innocence, the trust, the vulnerability in babies. But as we grow up in this world, we're conditioned by our perceptions in the world. And we see a lot of suffering in the world. And is the suffering bad? And when we're happy, when we have material stuff, oh, that's good, I want more material stuff. And what we find is, there's nothing wrong with the material world, but it doesn't give any kind of lasting satisfaction. There's nothing wrong with, you know, having nice clothes and driving a nice car, having a nice health, getting together with families. But the material world isn't what's important. That doesn't bring us lasting satisfaction. And so we have Jesus and Buddha. For me, Buddha taught freedom. Jesus taught love. And both of them really challenged us in doing this. Buddha says, when you meditate, when you cultivate awareness of the thinking mind, what you will find in your egoic mind, these beliefs, these concepts, actually are what create our suffering because the egoic mind wants things to be different than the way they are. And if you start looking at your life, it's like, well, you know, if my family was just different than the way they, were, they are, if my relationships were just different than the way they are, if the people at work were just different than the way they are, then I would be happy. 
what the Buddha taught was we can be happiness being present in what is not what we want the thinking mind if you meditate and you really look at it what you'll find is your thinking mind is always in past and future and never in the present moment present moment is the only thing that exists in the present moment all possibilities exist in the present moment you can find that love for your neighbor in the present moment you can find that love for your enemy in the present moment you can turn the other cheek in the present moment you can be like the rich man when Jesus said give all your stuff away and follow me and he said I'll get back to you about that Jesus <laughs> the path that Jesus outlined for us is not easy I love Mark's comment about consciousness because we're saying in the affirmations about unity here what we want is consciousness and who are we we are consciousness expressing through a limited finite form in this crucible called this life we get to test what's true for us and what isn't true for us and that's what the Buddha taught that complements what Jesus taught which is look inside see we all like to think about you know grow, growing up Baptist in Oklahoma it's like God is up there come down God help me God but you know what Jesus also said the kingdom of heaven my kingdom is inside and to enter the kingdom of heaven you must come as a child innocent trusting vulnerable how many of you as adults are vulnerable to the world of course you're not there's a lot of mean people out there <laughs> so the challenge is not to be innocent trusting and vulnerable for the world but to, for yourself to find the kingdom of heaven within and then that vibration creates the love you want to live in creates the love Jesus talked about the Buddha said that that we are consciousness we come into physical form as a karmic journey and this karmic journey is made up of fear greed and hatred and all the different variations of it do you know who the most difficult person is to love in this world Yourself. pop quiz you got it Jody you get you get an extra crumb cake <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's truly loving ourselves. Because our heads, our conditioning beliefs, will always find problems out in the world or within ourselves. Because we look in the mirror and there's always something we might like to change about ourselves. And then we project things outward onto the people. The Buddha said, purify the fear, greed, and hatred that you karmically came into this world with as a part of the crucible of who you are. And what will appear to you is your true nature called the Brahma Viharas. And I use the word Brahma Viharas translated as the heavenly abodes of love and compassion, joy, and peace. That's what everybody wants. There isn't one person on this planet that does not want love, compassion, joy, and peace. And I tell you what, some people have some real crazy ways of thinking they're going to find it. But it's not for me to judge another. It's not for me to criticize another. Because you know what? When I quit, quit criticizing and judging the world, what happens? That little critical judgmental voice in my head stops criticizing and judging me. I know because I'm living it there wasn't anybody that was more judgmental or critical than me and and we can compare notes after the service to see <laughs> to see if you're more judgmental and critical than I was because I thought I could my head could figure out the way and what I found out is my head couldn't figure out the way there's a surrendering process a letting go and there's nothing like some humbling experience like admitting you're an alcoholic 
because I don't want to be an alcoholic. I'm, I'm in control of my fate, and Lord knows I try to figure out every way possible to not be an alcoholic. But in the surrendering, the humbling myself to doing that, a whole new world opened up for me. And that's exactly what the Buddha is talking about when we purify the defilements of fear, greed, and hatred. And the purification of that is low frequency energy patterns. And when that's purified, the Brahma Viharas of love, compassion, joy, and peace start radiating through you. But they're selfless, impersonal. There's no you that's doing it because it's the nature of the universe. It's the nature of the Christ that we all have the potential of being because Jesus said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that we can experience heaven on earth. Let me tell you what I grew up with in the Baptist church. I'm not waiting till I die to find out if I, get to, if I go to heaven or hell. Because I look back at my life. Well, I've already done the hell part. Now I'm living the heaven part. And my head did not figure that out. But the very process that unity gives us is so profound. Because we st start real simple. Denials and affirmations. Right? Denials is simply when something negative comes up in you. You sweep, you deny that it has power. You sweep it away like cobwebs. You don't give it a lot of attention. You don't fight against it. You don't push it away. You simply sweep it away like cobwebs. And then you do the affirmation of who I am. What my desire is. If I'm in the present moment, not in past or future, if I'm in the present moment, well, how, what would my truth look like? Well, I've got a, my little practice is ASAP. And everybody knows what ASAP means. If you get a note from your boss, get in my office ASAP. Whoa! <laughs> that means he wants you now. And you're going to go, flutter, flutter, flutter. Oh no, what did I do now? For me, ASAP means awareness stillness, aliveness, and presence. And that is all about God the good omnipotent because that the awareness is only in the present moment. The true stillness is not the silence that can be disturbed when I'm trying to meditate and the cat or the dog is bugging me or a car drives by and my head gets agitated because I can't get the silence I want. That's in the human realm. That's not in the spiritual realm. There's a true stillness from where we come from. The consciousness that we come from. Awareness, stillness. The aliveness is only in the present moment. But if you're in your head, you're in past and future, not in the present moment. The present moment has such a depth to it. Such a resonance, such a vibration. It's beyond our understanding. And it's not that the head's bad or wrong. We need a head to develop a good road map. Unity gives us a great road map. And if you follow that road map with denials and affirmations, with affirmative prayer, looking at what thoughts do arise, but not judging them. Do not judge or criticize a single thought that arises because it's coming from the conditioned patterns of this karmic form that's created from birth heading towards death. And we all know that this human form is impermanent. This human form isn't going to last. And Lord knows the Christians are going, God, I'm coming to see you. You've got a mansion I'm going to. You've got many rooms. And what happens though when we start getting close to death? Oh no, I'm not ready to go yet. Why well, no, I'm holding on. These machines can keep me alive. I'm, oh, I'm going to stay here. Wait a minute, you were just praising God and I'm coming home. You know what? The true spiritual practice, because remember, a spiritual practice is something each person has to do. Religions can't do it for you. 
Seven billion, two hundred and thirty million people have to figure out their own path. And they're all unique. And they're all the same. It's a paradox. But it's like, you can go home now. You go home by knowing who you truly are. Awareness, stillness, aliveness, and presence. And it's a surrendering from this little egoic mind to surrendering into the big mind. The big mind of consciousness. God mind. God mind created it all. Our challenge is to embrace it all. And to realize I have created the world I'm living in. And my world has gotten pretty small because of my own thoughts and beliefs and opinions. We create a really small world. I know I sure did. And this is good and that's bad and I don't want this and I want more of that. And it took years, 27 years, to find out I can hold life with an open hand. I can simply show up and more and more I experience the present moment the depth and the richness of the present moment. And then what happens is, is awareness, stillness, aliveness leads to presence. And Eckhart Tolle has a beautiful expression about presence has always done the work. Presence has always done the work. And it, there's no you that's done the work. The Buddha says, look around inside and see if you can find a you. See if, you, see if you can find a you. Jody, I love this. When I say Jody, I got two of them. And I get two birds with, with one stone. Jody, John, Palma, Darla, Trish. I just went blank. No, it ain't. Brian. Brian? Brian, Mark. Now, Victor's an exception to the rule. <laughs> But, but it's, it's to find that mystery of our lives. And yeah, does it look real? Does it feel solid? Our, our suffering? The miracle is that we find blessings in our suffering. Instead of running from suffering, turn toward your suffering. Jesus, when he prayed in the garden, what did he say? Take this cup from my hand, God. Actually, he said, Abba. You know, Abba is like Daddy. It's really personal. It's not God. You know, it's not Father. Abba is a very intimate word. Abba. Abba, please take this cup from my hand. I'm going to go through great suffering. And there was resistance. He didn't want to do it. Take this cup from my hand. But when he finished his prayer, he surrendered into Abba, thy will be done, not mine. So Jesus suffered. Jesus didn't want to go through suffering. He didn't want to be tortured. He didn't want to be crucified. None of us want to be tortured or crucified. But you know what? We're doing it to ourselves. Nobody's doing it to us. It looks that way. We're looking out in the world, and it look, but it's not happening that way. We have created it because of the karmic journey. On this journey of life, I created my own suffering. And I see it clearly now because I would withdraw from the world. I would withdraw from people in, into my frustration, anger, depression. I would pull away in which I thought was I was trying to survive, but I was suffering. I'm not suffering anymore. I, I've learned to turn towards my suffering instead of trying to get away from it. So each one of us, it's like, Turn towards your suffering and find the magic, find the mystery in your own life. That the truth of who you are is consciousness. But that can't be handled at the level of the small mind, the ego mind. That's handled at the big mind level, the big heart level. So that's Jesus. Take this cup from my hand, but surrendering to God's will. Abba's will. Daddy's will. The divine will. And on the cross, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Physical suffering. He said, it's a horrible way to die. And they say it was like the Romans crucified a million Jews. Put them on the cross to put so much fear in the people 
that they, that they would submit to Roman rule. And what do we see today? There's still cruelty going on. But it's not true. Jesus said, don't judge by appearances. Don't judge by the appearances. Because we're all divine. We actually have it within ourselves. And we can see it in the present moment. But if you get locked in your stories of past and future, then it looks like people are doing things to us. People, places, and things are doing something to us. In the 12 steps, Jesus says, you've got to change your people, places, and things. Your playmates, playgrounds, and playthings. My mind went crazy. How can I do that? I'll be all alone. I was already alone in my addiction, in my depression, in my road rage. I was already alone. And paradoxically, trusting the 12 steps because I couldn't trust God yet brought me to a place of opening, a place of heaven on earth, a place of finding that innocence and trust and vulnerability in myself that I share with people with my dear friend Victor. And I won't tell, I won't tell him what you did to me last week. <laughs> He's such a blessing in my life. See, do you know that only people you love can hurt you? Because the other people don't care. <laughs> it's only the people that love you that can hurt you. So how do you turn and face that pain? Because they never did it intentionally. But we're all flawed human beings looking for that divine spark to express through us. And that's the whole thing about thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. That's the way I learned the third unity principle. That goes way back. Thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. If you have judgmental, critical thoughts about yourself and others, then you have a small world. Start coming into the present moment. Start finding that you can actually feel. You can feel in the present moment the nature of God. The nature of your Christ consciousness. In meditation, I've gone through hell in meditation purifying my soul. I go home now. I go home on a regular basis. But I can't tell you what it is, but I can experience it. I can guide other people there in wisdom training that I do with people. I've been through the valley of the shadow of death numerous times. I feel like I'm a tour guide now. <laughs> yeah, hey, come on, we'll go through this. You know, the old cliche about, you know, when you're going through the valley of, de valley of the shadow of death, don't pitch a tent. Keep walking. So many of us pitch a tent and we're going, oh, I'm suffering. We don't have to. We don't have to. These unity principles bring it alive. They absolutely bring denials and affirmations, affirmative prayer, Myrtle Fillmore, Charles Fillmore, what was created, how was it created from big mind, from Christ's mind, from God mind, because it's all God. And embracing it all is opening of the heart, the big heart, that says, you know what, we're all suffering. We're all suffering. But when you find the freedom within you, when you find the heaven on earth within you, you become an agent for change in consciousness. And now Victor is going to take us into meditation as coming empty-handed, going empty-handed. That is human. But there is one thing which always remains clear. It is pure and clear, not depending on life and death, which means this human form that you can awaken to the one pure and clear thing. So see if you can find it in meditation by simply quieting your mind, breathing down through your feet, grounding the body in the earth as you let your soul speak to you.